when you asked me to speak about women in fiction, I sat down on the banks of a river and began to wonder what the words meant. They might mean simply a few remarks about Fanny Burney, a few more about Jane Austen, a tribute to the Brontes, and a sketch of Howarth Parsonage under snow. And one would have done. But at second sight, the words seemed not so simple. The title, women and fiction, might mean women and what they're like, or it might mean women and the fiction that they write, or it might mean women and the fiction that is written about them, or it might mean somehow all three are inextricably mixed together and you want me to consider them in that light. But when I began to consider the subject in this last way, which seemed the most interesting, I soon saw that it had one fatal drawback. I should never be able to come to a conclusion. All I could do was to offer you an opinion upon one minor point. A woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. And that, as you will see, leaves the great problem of the true nature of woman and the true nature of fiction unsolved. But in order to make some amends, I'm going to do what I can to show you how I arrived at this opinion about the room and the money. I need not say that what I am about to describe has no existence. Oxbridge is an invention. I is the only convenient term for somebody who has no real being. Lies will flow from my lips, but there may perhaps be some truth mixed up with them. Here then was I, call me Mary Beaton, Mary Seaton, Mary Carmichael, or by any name you please, it's not a matter of any importance, sitting on the banks of a river a week or two ago in fine October weather, lost in thought. Thought, to call it by a prouder name than it deserved, had let its line down into a stream. It swayed minute after minute, hither and thither among the reflections and the weeds, letting the water lift it and sink it until, you know, the little tug, the sudden conglomeration of an idea at the end of one's line, and then the cautious hauling of it in and the careful laying of it out. Alas, laid on the grass, how small, how insignificant this thought of mine looked, the sort of fish that a good fisherman puts back into the water so that it may grow fatter and be one day worth cooking and eating. But however small it was, it had nevertheless the mysterious property of its kind. Put back into the mind, it became at once very exciting and important. And as it darted and sank and flashed hither and thither, set up such a wash and tumult of ideas, that it was impossible to sit still. It was thus that I found myself walking with extreme rapidity across a grass plot. Instantly, a man's figure rose to intercept me. His face expressed horror and indignation. Instinct rather than reason came to my help. He was a beadle. I was a woman. This was the turf. There was the path. Only the fellows and scholars were allowed here. The gravel is the place for me. Such thoughts were the work of a moment. As I regained the path, the arm for the beetle sank, his face assumed its usual repose, and though turf is better walking than gravel, no very great harm was done. The only charge I could bring against the fellows and scholars of whatever the college might happen to be was that in protection of their turf, they had sent my little fish into hiding. But curiosity remained. It is a perennial puzzle why no woman wrote a word of that extraordinary literature when every other man, it seemed, was capable of song or sonnet. What were the conditions in which women lived? I asked myself. For fiction, imaginative work, uh, that is, is not dropped like a pebble upon the ground, as science may be. Fiction is like a spider's web, attached, ever so lightly perhaps, but still attached to life at all four corners. Often the attachment is scarcely perceptible. Shakespeare's plays, for instance, seem to hang there, complete, by themselves. But when the web is pulled askew, hooked up, at the edge, torn in the middle. One remembers that these webs are not spun in midair by incorporeal creatures, but are the work of suffering human beings and are attached to grossly material things like health 
and money and the houses we live in. I went therefore to the shelf where the histories stand. I looked up women, found position of, and turned to the pages indicated. Wife beating, I read, was a recognised right of man and was practised without shame by high as well as by low. Similarly, the historian goes on, the daughter who refused to marry the gentleman of her parents' choice was liable to be locked up, beaten and flung about the room without any shock being inflicted on public opinion. I could not help thinking, as I looked at the works of Shakespeare on the shelf, that it would have been impossible, completely and entirely, for any woman to have written the plays of Shakespeare in the age of Shakespeare. Let me imagine what would have happened had Shakespeare had a wonderfully gifted sister called Judith, let's say. Shakespeare himself went, very probably, his mother was an heiress, to the grammar school where he may have learned Latin, Ovid, Virgil and Horace and the elements of grammar and logic. He was, it was well known, a wild boy who poached rabbits, perhaps shot a deer and had rather sooner than he should have done, married a woman in the neighbourhood who bore him a child rather quicker than was right. That escapade sent him to seek his fortune in London. He had, it seemed, a taste for the theatre. He began by holding horses at the stage door very soon. He got work in the theatre, became a successful actor, and lived at the hub of the universe, meeting everybody, knowing everybody, practising his art on the boards, exercising his wits in the streets, and even getting access to the palace of the Queen. Meanwhile, his extraordinarily gifted sister, let us suppose, remained at home. She was as adventurous, as imaginative, as agog to see the world as he was, but she was not sent to school. She had no chance of learning grammar and logic, let alone of reading Horace and Virgil. She picked up a book now and then, one of her brothers perhaps, read a few pages, and then her parents came in and told her to mend the stockings or mind the stew and not moon about with books and papers. Perhaps she scribbled some pages, up in an apple loft on the sly, but was careful to hide them or set fire to them. Soon, however, before she was out of her teens, she was to be betrothed to the son of a neighbouring wool stapler. She cried out that marriage was hateful to her, and for that she was severely beaten by her father. He then ceased to scold her. He begged her instead not to hurt him, not to shame him in this matter of her marriage. He would give her a chain of beads or a fine petticoat, he said, and there were tears in his eyes. How could she disobey him? How could she break his heart? The force of her own gift alone drove her to it. She made up a small parcel of her belongings. She let herself down by a rope one summer's night and took the road to London. She was not 17. She had the quickest fancy, a gift like her brother's for the tune of words. Like him, she had a taste for the theatre. She stood at the stage door. She wanted to act, she said. Men laughed in her face. The manager, a fat, loose-lipped man, guffawed. He bellowed something about poodles dancing and women acting. No woman, he said, could possibly be an actress. He hinted... You can imagine what... She could get no training in her craft, yet her genius was for fiction and lusted to feed abundantly upon the lives of men and women and the study of their ways. At last, for she was very young, oddly, like Shakespeare, the poet in her face, with the same grey eyes, at last the manager took pity on her. She found herself with child by that gentleman. And so... Who shall measure the heat and violence of the poet's heart when caught and tangled in a woman's body? Killed herself one winter's night and lies buried at some crossroads where the omnibuses now stop outside the elephant and castle. Here I would stop, but the pressure of convention decrees that every speech must end with a peroration. When I rummage in my own mind, I find no noble sentiments about being companions and equals and influencing the world to higher ends. I find myself saying briefly and prosaically that it is much more important to be oneself than anything else. Do not dream of influencing other people, I would say, if I knew how to make it sound exalted. Think of things in themselves. How can I further encourage you to go about the business of life? Young women, I would say, and please attend, for the peroration is beginning. My suggestion is a little fantastic. I prefer, therefore, to put it in the form of fiction. 
I told you that Shakespeare had a sister. Now, my belief is that this poet who never wrote a word and was buried at the crossroads still lives. She lives in you and in me and in many other women who are not here tonight for they are washing up the dishes or putting the children to bed. But she lives. For great poets do not die. They are continuing presences. They need only the opportunity to walk among us in the flesh. This opportunity is now coming within your power to give her. For my belief is that if we live another century or so, I'm talking of the common life, which is the real life, not of the little separate lives which we live as individuals, and have each of us rooms of our own. If we have the habit of freedom and the courage to write exactly what we think, if we escape a little from the common sitting room and see human beings not always in their relation to each other, but in relation to reality, if we face that there is no arm to cling to, but that we go along and that our relation is to the world of reality and not only to the world of men and women, then the opportunity will come. And the dead poet, who was Shakespeare's sister, will put on the body which she has so often laid down. Drawing her life from the lives of the unknown who were her forerunners, she will be born. As for her coming without that preparation, without that effort on our part, without that determination that when she is born again, she shall find it possible to live and to write her poetry, that we cannot expect, for that would be impossible. But I maintain that she would come if we worked for her. And that so to work even in poverty and obscurity is worthwhile.